It is uncommon for a ship's crew to have completely vanished without any sign of struggle or peril and for the ship to be able to continue on adrift in near perfect condition. It took a modern chemistry lab to solve a mystery from 1872. For generations, the story of the Mary Celeste was filled with wild theories about curses and madness, but the real culprit was hiding in the cargo hold the entire time. Scientists recently recreated the conditions on that ship, and the results were shocking. A specific type of pressure blast that makes a massive boom but leaves no fire damage. This explains everything. The crew wasn't crazy. They were reacting to a terrifying event that science has only just understood. Basically, we finally know why they jumped, and that is putting it lightly. Cracking the 150-year-old case. The Mary Celeste was packing 1,700 barrels of industrial alcohol. That is a volatile cargo. Later inspections showed that nine of those barrels were empty. They were made of red oak, which is porous and leaky, unlike the tight white oak used for the rest. Alcohol leaked out. It turned into vapor. In a closed ship hold, that vapor builds up silently. In 2006, a chemist named Dr. Andrea Sella decided to test what happens when you ignite that specific kind of vapor buildup. He built a scale model of the hold and lit it up. The result was not the Hollywood fireball everyone expects. It was a pressure explosion, a massive terrifying boom that blew open the hatches and sent a wave of hot air rushing out. But here is the catch. It did not burn the wood. The paper cartons he used in the experiment were still standing. This changes everything. It means a massive explosion could have rocked the Mary Celeste, terrifying the captain and crew without leaving any scorched marks for the investigators to find later. But it is not that simple, though. There was another piece to the puzzle. Researchers analyzed the navigation. They looked at the chronometer, the ship's super-accurate clock. If that clock is wrong, you do not know where you are. By running computer models of the drift, they found that Captain Briggs likely thought he was 120 miles closer to land than he actually was. So, put yourself in his shoes. You think land is close. You have a cargo that just made a booming noise and blew the hatches off. You have a family on board. You do not wait around to see if the ship explodes for real. You get off. The science proves that the ship did not have to be broken to scare them off. It just had to bark loud enough. But before the science could speak, the world had to find the ghost ship first. Boarding the Mary Celeste. Let's rewind to where the legend actually started. It is early December, 1872. A British ship called the Dei Gratia is sailing across the North Atlantic. The captain spots a sail ahead. He knows ships. He knows how they move. And what he sees makes his skin crawl. The other ship is yawing, moving wildly, not keeping a straight line. No one is at the wheel. No one is waving. As they get closer, they read the name, Mary Celeste. She had left New York a month earlier. She should have been in Italy by now. Instead, she is drifting aimlessly near the Azores. The crew of the Dei Gratia rows over. They climb up the side, expecting maybe a sick crew or a broken rudder. What they find is silence, absolute heavy silence. The sails are torn but still up. The deck is empty. They go below, and this is where it gets creepy. There is water in the bottom of the ship, but not enough to sink her. The cargo is there. The food is there. The crew's pipes and clothes are still in their lockers. What most people don't realize is that nothing was stolen. If this was a robbery, it was the worst one in history. But one thing was missing, the lifeboat. The area where the small boat should have been was empty, and the rail was removed, hinting that it was launched on purpose. The ship's pump was taken apart on the deck, like someone was trying to fix it in a hurry. The logbook was sitting on the desk, with the last entry written 10 days earlier. That means this ship had been sailing itself, completely alone, for over a week. It was a ghost ship in the truest sense, a perfectly good vessel, floating in the middle of the ocean, with absolutely no one to steer her. The sailors from the Dei Gratia sailed her to port, hoping for a reward. But instead of a thank you, they got suspicion. The authorities could not wrap their heads around it. How does a ship stay afloat while the people vanish? It just did not add up. To understand why they left, you have to meet the people who vanished, the crew that never returned. It is easy to think of the people on the Mary Celeste as characters in a scary movie, 
but they were real people with families, plans, and lives they wanted to get back to. The captain, Benjamin Spooner Briggs, was a pro. He came from a family of captains. He was 37, experienced, and deeply religious. He didn't drink alcohol, which is ironic considering his cargo. He was known for being calm and fair. This was not a guy who panicked over nothing. He had invested his own money into the ship. He had skin in the game. You do not just walk away from your life savings unless you truly believe you are about to die. And he wasn't alone. His wife, Sarah, was with him. She was tough, a minister's daughter who had sailed with him before. She knew the sea. They brought their two-year-old daughter, Sophia, along for the trip. They left their seven-year-old son, Arthur, back home with his grandmother so he could go to school. That detail is crucial. You don't leave your kid behind if you are planning to disappear and start a new life. You leave him behind because you fully expect to be back in a few months. The crew wasn't a bunch of random drifters either. The first mate, Albert Richardson, was trusted by the family. The other sailors were experienced Germans with clean records. They were described as peaceable men. These were guys who did their job and sent money home. Everyone's obsessed with the idea of a mutiny or a crazed monster. But looking at who these people were, it just doesn't fit. Sarah wrote letters home right before they left, talking about how nice the ship was. The crew was happy. The captain was confident. There was no tension, no anger, no bad blood. So, we have a solid ship, a calm captain, a happy crew, and a mother with her baby. They were halfway to Italy, doing their job. And then, in a single moment, something happened that made Benjamin Briggs decide that a tiny, open lifeboat in the middle of the Atlantic was safer than his big, sturdy ship. But the world didn't care about facts. They wanted a monster story. Why the rumors took over. When the Mary Celeste was found, the newspapers went wild. Humans hate unanswered questions. So, when the facts didn't provide an answer, people started making things up. The first theory was pirates. It's the classic go-to. But here is the catch. Pirates steal things. The alcohol was still there. The personal items were still there. Who boards a ship, eliminates everyone, and leaves the gold watch on the table? Nobody. Then came the mutiny theory. People whispered that the German crew got drunk on the cargo and eliminated the captain. But remember, the alcohol was industrial stuff. You drink that, you go blind or die. Plus, there was no blood. No signs of a struggle. The captain's sword was under his bed, clean. If there was a fight, it was the tidiest fight in history. Then things got ridiculous. People blamed giant squids. They blamed sea monsters. One writer even suggested a giant wave washed them all off at once, which is impossible because the ship was dry below decks. Later, people even threw aliens into the mix because why not? A lot of this mess came from a guy named Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah, the Sherlock Holmes guy. Before he was famous, he wrote a fiction story about the ship, adding fake details like half-eaten breakfasts and smoking pipes. He changed the name to the Marie Celeste. People believed it was real. His fiction became the public's fact. Basically, the world turned a tragedy into a circus. They ignored the boring truth for a sensational lie. They wanted a villain. They wanted a ghost. But the reality was likely much simpler and much sadder. It wasn't a monster from the deep that doomed them. It was a simple misunderstanding of physics and a bit of bad luck. Now, let's put the real pieces together and watch the disaster unfold, how it actually ended. So, knowing what we know now about the science, here is how the final, desperate hour of the Mary Celeste likely played out. It is late November, 1872. The Atlantic Ocean is unforgiving, and the weather has been rough for weeks. The Mary Celeste has been fighting storms for days, battered by heavy swells and freezing winds. Captain Benjamin Briggs is a seasoned sailor, but he is tired. The constant motion of the ship and the howling wind have frayed everyone's nerves. He checks his position, but there is a critical error. His chronometer is wrong. He believes he is close to the safety of the Azores, thinking land is just over the horizon. But in reality, he is off course. But there is a bigger, invisible problem brewing beneath his feet. The ship had recently been refitted, and during that work, construction debris and coal dust were left behind. Now, after days of tossing in the storm, that dust has washed down into the bilge. The pumps, the ship's only way of clearing water, are clogged solid. 
Briggs sounds the well, trying to measure the water level, but he gets no clear reading. He knows the ship is leaking. Every wooden ship leaks a little. But without working pumps, he can't tell if it's a manageable trickle or if they are slowly sinking. That is stress factor number one. Then, the chemistry takes over. The cargo in the hold consists of 1,701 barrels of industrial alcohol. Crucially, these barrels are made of red oak, a porous wood that is far more permeable than the white oak usually used for such dangerous cargo. As the temperature shifts, perhaps moving from cold air into a warmer current, the alcohol inside starts to expand and vaporize. The hold fills with volatile, invisible fumes. It becomes a pressurized bomb waiting for a trigger. Maybe a sailor opens a hatch to air it out. Maybe the friction of the barrels rubbing together creates a spark. Then, everything changes in a split second. A pressure explosion rocks the ship. It isn't a fiery, Hollywood-style detonation that burns the rigging. It is a cold explosion, a massive release of expanding gas. The pressure is so intense that the heavy main hatch covers are blown straight into the air, landing upside down on the deck. A blast of cold air rushes in to fill the void. The ship shakes violently, shuddering from stem to stern. There is no fire, but Captain Briggs doesn't know that. He hears the boom, sees the smoke-like vapor, and feels the ship lurch. In his mind, his cargo is about to turn the Mary Celeste into a splinter bomb. He has his wife, Sarah, and his two-year-old daughter, Sophia, on deck. He has seconds to decide their fate. He makes the only choice a father and captain can make. He orders the lifeboat launched. This isn't an abandoned ship forever move. It is a tactical retreat. It's a let's get off for an hour, trail behind on a rope, and see if she blows up move. Panic sets in, but it is controlled chaos. They grab the navigational instruments, the sextant and the chronometer, because if the ship sinks, they will need them to find land. They grab some food, but in the rush, they leave behind their pipes and personal belongings. They don't think they are leaving for good. They pile into the small boat, seven crew members, the captain, his wife, and the baby. They likely tie a long tow line to the Mary Celeste, planning to drift safely behind her until the danger passes. But nature doesn't care about plans. The wind suddenly picks up. The sails on the Mary Celeste, which were set to ride out the breeze, catch a fresh gust. The rope, pulled taut by the heavy lurching ship, snaps under the strain. Or perhaps, in their terror, it wasn't tied tight enough. The big ship lurches forward. The heavy Mary Celeste picks up speed, her sails filling with wind, sailing away straight and true. The crew in the lifeboat grabs the oars and tries to row, but it is hopeless. You cannot catch a brigantine under full sail with a rowboat in choppy waters. They watch their safe, warm, and floating ship disappear over the gray horizon. The realization hits them harder than the storm. They are alone, 10 people in a tiny open boat hundreds of miles from land, with limited water and no shelter from the freezing Atlantic spray, the Mary Celeste wasn't taken by ghosts. She was taken by fear. It is a reminder that sometimes the scariest things aren't monsters, but the choices we make in a panic. Do you think you would have stayed on board after that explosion? Hit the like button if you enjoyed this deep dive, and subscribe for more Solved Mysteries.